I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Noalani Puni Wai uh, as our speaker today of the Nyquist webinar. Noalani is currently serving as a postdoc in geography at the University of Hawaii in Hilo, where her interests lie in working with communities and across disciplines to progress the health of the people in Aina Kai, which is the Hawaiian word for environment scientist, native Hawaiian community member, and science educator, Noalani wears many hats and tries to facilitate the communication of knowledge between scientists, local communities, and management agencies. Her family means surrounded by or all about water, making water her purifier, her connector, and her kuleana, which is the Hawaiian word for responsibility, to conserve and protect from the tops of the mountain to the depths of the sea. She grew up on the banks of the Wauwuku River and diving in the tide pools of Kapoho, where she continues to raise her three children today. I would like to uh, welcome Neilana uh, uh, for her talk titled Recreational Seascapes, Integrating Human and Mechanical Observations on Hawaii Island. Thank you so much, Neilani. Thanks for having me today. I wanted to start off um, my presentation with just a little snap of who I am. That's why I wanted to have the webcam showing. Because a lot of my presentation is going to really focus on face-to-face, -face, te alo a he alo, how we relate to each other. There you are. So good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today as we talk about seascapes. I'll probably start this, con this presentation off more as a conversation. Um, and knowing that a lot of you might not come from places with ocean, places with marine resources, it's pretty interchangeable to think of everything that I'm talking about today in the, la in the ways of seascapes, of landscapes, of riverscapes, of any part of environment that you can relate with, um, and the people that relate to those places. So recreation is a very broad term, and every place has its own type of personal recreation, and recreation specific to that place. So if you start getting lost and figuring out how does this apply to you, just start thinking of the communities that you work with and the recreation that's available in those areas. Okay. I'll probably try and bring my webcam on again at the end. Um, when I can ask questions, but for now, I'll switch to my presentation. And if my audio gets started here, please let me know as well. Thank you. So I titled my talk, Recreational Seascapes. Because I'm looking at the ocean and how people relate to the ocean. And recreation is a very interesting word because it has a lot of different importance to it, um, which I don't really go into in this talk. But I think it's a good way of understanding how people normally spend their time on a place. I need to give a lot of thanks to the people that have been helping me with this information um, and this research. My professors, Stephen Gray, Chris Lutchuk, Craig Severance, and a lot of the students who have also been a part of the program, such as Aloha, Cherie, Stephanie, and Janelle from this past summer. I'm going to be sharing with you a little journey today. I spent the last few years listening. I want to learn more about the connection that people still have today with our world, with our oceans, with our environment, both what drives them in their interactions and what they understand about it. I think the solutions for our ability to take care of our resources, to prepare for climate change, is in these people still connected to the ocean, to our resources. So I listen to the watermen, the souls who experience the true ocean. I listen to the ones that have provided their livelihood from the ocean's generosity such as Uncle Mitch, who was a commercial fisherman his whole life. I listen and ask questions of those who have spent their lives been immersed in the ocean's beauty, the his death. Many of these fishermen come in all ages, all genders, all nationalities. It's that relationship to the resource, however, that's very interesting to me. From the stories, from their understanding, I try to understand how they mentally model, how they describe the ocean, the resources, because through understanding their worldview, I feel that we can acknowledge and integrate 
their information about our resources to better manage it together. Most of my work has been taking place in the Hawaiian Islands, and in particularly on the Big Island, Hawaii, and in this little bay called Hilo Bay. But before I get any further, before I start influencing your perspectives, I would like each of you to take a few seconds to close your eyes and envision in yourself a seascape. What comes to mind? Is it an imaginary one? One from a movie? Is it your favorite memory? A place you want to go? What comes to mind when I say the word seascape? Because as you can tell, it's a very personal image. I can't predict what's in your mind when I say the word seascape, and neither can you understand the seascapes that these people I've interviewed understand. Because even though I've only started my conversation with them, I still have so much, so much more to learn from them each. And then why does it matter what this definition of seascape is? How does it relate to what I've been studying? And then more importantly for this climate change series, how does studying the seascape relate to climate change? If you Google the word seascape, you'll get lots of images such as this. Some might be cartoony, some are pictures or paintings of the coastlines. Depending on where you're from, you may think of this when I talk about islands and areas of interactions between the ocean and shore. Everyone will have a different image based on where they're from and what they're familiar or unfamiliar with. Seascapes tell us about a particular place. They can tell us what's valued, the location of things, what's important to people, and where they are in the world. Recently, people have used it geographically to understand, denote, and manage spaces. Some people see the simplicity in the quantitative dimensions. But there's something core at the heart of a seascape. And what's missing from these images is us. A more common representation of a living seascape is a cultural seascape. It shows us people's interactions with the ocean, along the coastline, their activities, their priorities. I'm one of a few researchers internationally looking at seascapes and understanding how the seascape can help us in our management efforts. However, universally across all of our research, people are a part of the seascape. The research of seascape is still very immature and compared to that of the landscape. Yet we in the Pacific, we here in Hawaii, we are people of the ocean and we understand seascapes. How it changes based on ocean conditions and cultural perspectives. And what we call these are coupled human natural systems. Many of you guys might be studying coupled human natural systems. And through that, we recognize that a seascape involves the broad range of meanings that individual and social groups place on the environment. A seascape, it shares our identity. It talks about the interactions that people have between and among themselves, the community, living and non-living in a place. You can see that seascape is much more complex than just a painting of the ocean. Sometimes when we hear a word for so long, such as the word seascape, you forget the context that the word can be used in is dependent on the discipline that you're in. I really like the writing of Anita Marstad, who writes about Norway oceanic communities. She states that when fishermen no longer use the seascape and perpetuate their knowledge, place names, and understanding of local conditions, that the seascape will disappear, and it'll turn into a sea wilderness. The sea must be seen as a cultural space in our worldview. Otherwise, we return to the past, where for centuries, the biological resources of the sea seemed endless. A well-respected kupuna in Hawaii, she says that culture anchors a people to a space-based reality. So the culture is what connects you to a space-based reality in place and time. We cannot talk about places, we can't talk about environments, what they're like now and how they might be in the future without knowing the culture of that place. 
and realizing that that is an interconnection. Therefore, we see that natural resource management, ocean resource management, all of these are really managing multiple uses and meanings of the ocean. With major funding from the Pacific Islands Climate Science Center and a fellowship through the Hawaii Mellon Fellows and the Kohala Center, I've been trying to understand how using the perspectives of seascapes can help elevate our understanding of the effects of climate change on local communities. The Pacific Islands Climate Science Center and many of the other climate science centers want to understand the implications of climate change on people here on Hawaii and particularly Native Hawaiians. And my approach, is into, my approach to this is to understand what resources and places are most vulnerable, what practices may be affected, and how we can prepare our communities and increase our resilience. I've been working on this by understanding what our climate patterns have been like and how these are known to affect us. I'll show you some of these examples with two projects um, that I've currently wrapped up. Recently published in Human Ecology is the communication of ocean current knowledge and how we've learned about it through human observations. Ike Kiao Nui Kiao Wiki is a Hawaiian saying that I've been using to st in my research. This saying itself says, look at the big currents, look at the little currents. It was said in a saying as someone came on a journey being judged. They asked to be looking, look at the big picture, look at the little picture. And it ends with the saying, he alo, he alo, face to face. Look at everything around you face to face. And I like this saying because it's very deep. It has a, a simple literal translation, and it has so much implications within it. If you start thinking of how do you look at a situation, you have to really look at it through multiple perspectives, deep and little. So monitoring and understanding our ocean and how it changes requires fully knowing the relationship between the physical and the cultural dynamics. I'll explain more what I mean by these. These social cultural seascapes, the physical and the cultural, they're changed together. And I simplify them <clears throat> by studying them on two main axes. And I feel that only by integrating these can we really understand the different ways in which we can understand and describe seascapes. We can think of the physical seascapes as the variables that scientists use to characterize the environment. We can start with simple features such as temperature, or substrate, and proceed to more complex understandings, integrating many variables together. We use mechanical sensors, such as these in the marine environment, to monitor wave regime, stream flow, rainfall, all these different systems that managers use to predict the effects and implications of climate change. On the opposite side, we can look at the cultural seascapes and how I use human observation systems to understand the cultural seascapes. Because objective data alone will not predict society's response to a change in climate. If we understand how climate change is going to affect us in the future, we need to understand the cultural implications of change. This cultural seascape incorporates the use of, when using the human observation system, we get to see what's shared by recreationists, fishers, ocean watermen, see how they internalize climate and environmental changes important to their interactions with the resource. So what did I find out? I interviewed people of all ages and associations that were recommended as experts in the ocean. These experts included fishermen, paddlers, lifeguarders, surfers, sailors. And out of those 30 people I interviewed, I characterize their ability to communicate their knowledge. So this analysis isn't really looking at what they shared. It's, just, um, it's talking about how they shared it and their ability to share this knowledge. So the first quote you can see shows uh, unlimited ability to communicate ocean knowledge. I noticed when the river is really strong and when the high tide is coming up. Yeah, maybe they weren't able to articulate much more than that. Um, going up the scale, there are some people who say, you know, I really don't know it that much, but I do know how some things work around here. And they might be able to draw it or to talk about it. 
Yeah, we also had people that were very detailed in the, for their information, either spatially or quantitatively, such as this um, lifeguard. He was able to quantify his information of how the currents move in a particular location. So what kind of questions were they trying to answer? A basic question I had is, what is the scale of the human observing system? What are these things, these variables that they understand, and then how does it compare to the physical system, the information that we get from these mechanical devices? And what we see is, um, this site's got a lot of information, so let me walk you through it. On the left side here, we have a picture of Honolulu Bay. Right here is a river coming out and the ocean coming in from this side. Each different color shows a different surfer's interpretation on their map of how the currents work in a place. On the right side, I've kind of summarized all the information that ocean people talked about in regards to Hilo and Honolulu Bay. And I talk about the scale of maps that they chose to share the information on and the number of maps that were shared at that scale. So the surfers, the, in, the sailors, watermen, all of them, the people that are interviewed, were given maps to draw on, and they were interviewed. So all of it was all audio transcribed. And as you can see, that the maps that they chose from, they had a scale of just five different maps to choose from. Yet people in each discipline, no matter if they were a surfer or a fisher or a paddler, they all chose maps with a 1 to 5,000 scale, which is the same scale as that shown on the left here to talk about their information about the ocean. That in itself is really interesting because it hasn't been documented before. What is the scale that humans operate on the seascape with? Of course, there's more, more work to be done about this, but this 1 to 5,000 scale is, seems really important. And it's not the smallest scale that they were given. Um, they were also given a scale of 1 to 2,500, yet very little people wrote or described um, the ocean on that scale. Another way of presenting that same map is on the left here, you see everybody's individual interview, because each person was given a blank map on which to draw on. And then we geodatabased and digitized all their information. We compiled it um, and with their interviews and all the demographic information. And what you see here is that even though we can integrate all their information to what map, what we're doing is losing those individual stories that we see on the left. Because those individual stories are showing different variables and different things that are important, different functions of the ocean for each person. So to really get a compiled map on the right, um, it probably isn't very feasible to just add up everybody's um, layers together. Another way to show this, um, on the bottom right, you see what Hilo Bay looks like. Where's my little point to go? Down here is Hilo Bay. This light um, black line along the coastline. And we did the same thing with this one. On the left, if you look at them, you kind of think that all well, mostly people are talking about the same currents in the same places. Um, and that's the stories that come out. However, when you integrate them all together, that's not really applicable to showing how their information is, a bit, is able to be seen. To talk about it in one other way, we created a graph to show the spatial and temporal skills in which they shared their information and the spatial and temporal skills that are available for mechanical devices. So in gray, you see the scale that the um, high-frequency radar and the different models um, create outputs at. And in the blue squares, you see the outputs of skills that the ocean expert watermen talked about in their interviews with us. And what you see is, is they're not really an overlap with the majority of the fishermen and the surfers and the canoe paddlers in the water with the information that's available from the mechanical devices. We see that the images needed by most of the watermen on the ocean is not provided by the scientific instruments. And so, however, the instrument, the information may be available on these people on the land. So we know that the, the knowledge exists. It's just in different, um, different formats. And what we need are people with different skills to bridge these divides. We need researchers that can talk to the watermen, the people on the ocean, who understand the ocean. And what is them? In the second project I did, 
I try to understand what are those important variables and how can they be used? How can we really integrate the information from these mechanical devices with the human systems? In the slide before, I showed you how there seems to be a little gap between the connection of the two. So instead, I try to find um, an act, a process, that would make it a little bit more easier to integrate these two systems together. And I came up with the idea of surfing. Because surfing, as we know, surfers all have to learn their ocean to be able to participate and act. If they don't understand the system that they're participating in, then they won't be able to surf. We also know that surfers are amazing in their ways to follow the oceanographic and meteorologic data. They are scientists. They look at the wave flow, they look at the wave period, they understand the wind flow. They use all of those to predict in their minds how the surf is going to be like on that day. So what is surf? Surf quality, that's how we kind of define the word surf, is defined as not just the dynamics of a breaking wave, but the results of waves interacting with conditions on the shoreline, physically and socially, to create surf. The work done in Australia, New Zealand, and California all show the same thing, that surf quality is just as importantly the social conditions of a site, not just the interactions of the wave on the shoreline. This is key to understanding the different measures of surfing and how people rank surfing, and to understand that it's just as much um, how they perceive it. It's their value judgment. To think about it another way, you can think that the social conditions of the site is, is it raining today? Maybe is it drizzling? How old are you? If you're 12 years old and you're out there with your five best friends, does it really matter how big those waves are? Not really. You're there with your best friends. The waves are epic. What if you go off to work one day and the waves, again, are one to two feet, they're nothing, but you had a bad day in the office and all you needed is some time on the ocean. All of those things interact with your expectations of what is good surf. Defining surf, therefore, is not just the physical water quality and wave conditions, but it's also the social conditions of that site. So my overlying question was, how do surfers and scientists understand trends in surf quality? So if we're trying to understand how is climate change going to affect a place, how is it um, based on those conditions, Let's try and see what the local people also think about those conditions. So I surveyed surfers at Honolulu and asked them what is good surf, how was surf in the past, and what are their predictions for surf in the future, based on different scenarios that I presented them with. I compared their information to scientific data that has monitored the coastline. This information includes graphs of climate and ocean conditions, which we created and presented to them. Um, we also in Included climate predictions. So, how is the climate expected to change in these areas? And then, socially, we also try to understand how much people and what types of people have been going to the ocean over time. We administered a survey with about 104 questions to over 100 surfers in the in the winter of December and February of 2014. It was an anonymous survey, and we approached all William surfers above age 18. After about 75 and 80 interviews, we kind of reached a peak in which most of the adult surfers on site had been surveyed. The survey took about 20 minutes in length, and it was really fun to engage with the surfers. They really liked taking the survey, although it was really long. Um, but more than that, they liked to engage in the ideas that we were asking them, which is a good reason to include surfers in your study in the future. So what makes good surf? That was an easy question for surfers to understand. As you can see in this left graph, we asked them what direction do they love this swell to come from at this particular surf break in Honolulu. And a majority of the surfers said they love surf that comes from the northeast direction. Um, about 15% of people also like surf that came from the north, northeast, and east, northeast. So it's easy to define as a group what conditions make good surf. Same thing on the right. The graph on the right shows you wind direction. And it shows you, I asked them the question, if they like surf offshore, onshore, and how strong do they like the winds. And almost everyone likes the graph on the top left. They love offshore winds at zero to five miles an hour. That was a resounding um, almost half of all, 88% of all the surveyors. Similarly, if you ask them, how the surf is like when it comes from particular directions, so getting a little bit more detailed information. You can see that on the left here, 
this A direction, surf that comes from the northwest direction, is pretty flat. They were asked to rate the conditions of surf on a scale of 1 to 10 from flat to epic, using terms that they you know, can understand. However, if you look at surf that comes from the sea, from the northeast direction, just as they asked in their previous question, you can see that the surfers really liked the surf that came from this direction. However, in general, sorry, in general, surfers did not observe any trends in the data. Um, they, were, they, were easily, they were easily able to define their perfect surf conditions, yet they weren't able to define any patterns in the surf conditions over time at a single place. All of the answers came back normally distributed. So what did the scientific data look like? What we find from the mechanical observations are that most of the qualities of the defined surf quality are decreasing. Here's an example of stream flow and rainfall at that same river here in Honolulu um, that come and help create the surf break. These are questions that the surfers said were very important to making good surf on site. Yet we can see that over the past 30 years, we've had a significant decline in both stream flow and rainfall at this site. Similarly, if we look at the wind conditions, mean annual um, wind speed and the mean annual significant wave height, we can see that these have also both been decreasing over the last 30 years. And of course, we also see that wave height has a significant influence on surf conditions. And the last part, uh, one of the other variables that we, we graphed was the swell direction. So what direction has the swells been coming in? And it looks like over the past few years that most of the swell direction is coming from the straight east and not from the northeast. Um, and we can think about how this is going to change the condition in the future. One of the last conditions, which most surfers didn't think that sea level rise and had an influence in a place such as a stream bed, um, but we can tell them that the sea level has risen over, um, over the last 100 years in Hilo Bay and is expected to rise at a much faster rate in the future. So what did we find from this? How do surfers and scientists understand trends in surf quality? Well, when we asked the surfers what was surf like in the past, both physically and socially, so first physically, how did they think um, surf was in the past? They think it was great. There was always good times always crappy times. That was pretty easy. It was pretty redundant. If we asked them over five years, 10 years, or 20 years, how has the surf changed? None of the surfers were able to see a trend in surf quality at the site. However, I think more than a shifting baseline, I think this has to do with the fact that most of the surfers have socially, have seen the social conditions at the site change just as much. When they started off surfing, they had a different um, group of friends, they had a different group of people that they engaged with on the site, and the conditions of the site were different. 30 years ago at Honolulu, there was a lot of sugar cane gas, there was a lot, the water quality wasn't very strong, and the site conditions, it was a jungle to get down to the surf break. Nowadays, it's more of a park, peaceful place, a lot of family members, a lot more female surfers in the water. The surfers talked about these changing social and physical changes in the place to say that nothing's really good or bad, it just changes, and that's what's expected at the site. And then when we gave them forecasts for the future, it's like in the future, we're predicted in Hilo to have more sunny days, um, which is very different from our past um, climate. The surfers also see the intermingling of social conditions in those forecasts. They think, well, you know, sunny days usually mean flat conditions, yet it means that I'll probably want to go to the beach more. Maybe I'll take my kids or my grandkids. So it would be a plus for some, for some variables and a negative for other variables. So it, was, it wasn't um, feasible for any of the surfers to separate the physical and the social variables in their predictions of how surf climate change might be affected. And the scientific data seems a lot more straightforward. All the conditions that create good surf have been decreasing over the last 30 years. And it isn't just a recent trend. It's been going on for a while. And when we talk about what kind of changes we can predict in the future, the forecast, again, we see that the forecasted conditions for the, or for the site are less winds, um, less frequent rainfall, a little bit more squalls, 
Um, but once in a while, we're supposed to have more storms. And those storms bring better shore conditions. And that's kind of why the surfers were a little confused. Um, and socially, we see that the amount of surfers at Honolulu has been going up two times, yet there's been different types of dynamics with those increases. So we see more paddle boarders. We see more boogie boarders. We see a lot of younger kids. And so it means that the social conditions on site have been changing and adjusting along with the physical condition. So it's not something we can easily separate from each other. OK. So in summary, we can say that the spatial skills and ocean conditions important to surfers can be modeled, perhaps, by some of the mechanical devices that scientists have. Yet to understand them, we need to understand the social side of it. We also found out that the, we also were able to map the spatial skills that were important to people. We could tell that 1 to 5,000 map scale, which is, is a pretty good understanding of the coastline. So if we want to go and do further surveys in the future, such as I'll be doing this coming month, um, we know what map scales are really important to the surfers, um, watermen, fishers, sailors. Um, and are able to try and help them explain and communicate their information to us on a scale that is easy for them to understand. We were also able to witness the changes that they've seen over time. When you interview people in a place, you're looking at the same seascape. You're looking at those conditions, and you're mapping them with them. Understanding the variables that are important to people is the only way that we can understand how climate change will um, influence their actions into the future. We can't predict what their actions are going to be like based on quantitative data alone. We need to understand the social conditions that they interact with. So the integration of both human and mechanical observations ensure that multiple systems of knowledge are included and valued. By understanding how they have been integrating this information through time and how they're expected to integrate it into the future, helps us predict and prepare managers for a new, a new reality. A quote by Dr. Aluli Meyer states that experience the world is different from how you experience the world. Yet both our interpretations matter. I think sometimes we get stuck in the idea that the data has no value to it outside of the quantitative numbers. Yeah, it does. And the way people analyze that, integrate it, and internalize it is different for each person. Just as in the beginning, I talked about what is your seascape. And mine, my inability to understand what your seascape is in your mind creates a barrier to our connection. It's only through relationships and face-to-face, -face, working in our communities, working with the different social um, conditions that are around us, we'll be able to bridge that barrier and start communicating in a language that both of us understand. The surfers work on the ocean. They observe different variables on the ocean than the fishermen does. Even though I love them all as watermen, they each define different variables that they understand on the ocean. And the skills of data that we create for them and then ask them for input on may be at such different scales that it's not applicable for their information. The mechanical data that we have answers questions about the characterizing of the dynamics. It's all relative to a question, all the answers. But the human observing system, they only understand things that are relevant to their activity. They understand what processes need to be encoded in a certain place. So they're not trying to understand a question. They're trying to understand things relevant to the activity that they're doing on the water. So both of these systems have different processes and are practical for different reasons. And understanding that will help us create resilient communities by recognizing that everybody has a different worldview and that together we need to understand how people relate to places to therefore understand how to manage them. That is how I believe we can create resilient communities. And so as I wrap up my presentation, I ask each of you, how do you bond? How do you relate to your place? How do the communities that live in your place, biological, plants, the elements, the people on the landscape, on the seascape, how do they relate to the Aina? Only to understand those relationships can we support the resiliency. I believe that to address climate change, we need to see a spiritual and cultural transformation. When I started off my path in research over 20 years ago, I was like many environmentalists. I'm a child of the 70s. 
I had the book How Do You Save Nature, and I thought by understanding science, I would be able to save the world, but only through realizing that to truly have an impact in our work, we need to practice and preach Aloha Aina. We need to understand how people are connected to a place, and we need to understand that relationship they have to that place. We need to love the places we are from. Only by loving something can you truly try and work to create it, to, to capture it, to love it, to make it succeed. You have to nurture these places. And these places include the people that live upon them as well. It's not just the conditions, the processes of the environment. So our transformation entails moving beyond practice and into our own awareness of how we relate on the landscape. Through practice, through Relating to these seascapes, to these environments, can we awaken ourselves and make it accessible and understand what each place needs so that it can be resilient? With that, I'll take questions from everyone. Again, my name is Noilani Puniwa, and I gave my email. Um, I'm always available for questions. And any other kind of information that people might have. And I leave you with this picture of my children. Because as I raise my children, I want them to navigate their future. I want them to understand and be peely, be connected to the future of their ocean. Understand what kind of processes and how they'll be able to understand it. And I'll take questions with that. Excellent. Thank you yeah. very much. All right, uh, so as Nolani says, we'll be opening the conference to questions now. Uh, yes, Hawaii is an island isolated uh, from a lot of what goes on in other places. Does the isolation affect the political perspective of the surfers and residents? It's an in interesting meeting other people who study surfers. I recently attended a conference on um, tourism and recreational values. And people who study surfers in Maryland in California, in the Philippines, and Thailand, they all see things very similarly. All of our demographics of people, the way they relate to the ocean, seems to have um, a very similar effect across. So I don't think our isolation really affects us. I think surfers themselves are unique, but they're not unique to Hawaii alone. Um, but as far as the residents go, I think the residents of Hawaii are much more multicultural than we think of. I think our demographics have been changing such that less than half of the people who live in Hawaii currently, um, their grandparents lived here. So we are becoming much more global community. However, that's what kind of drives a lot of my research is understanding how people's relationship to the ocean changes through time. Um, and it gets me really kind of sad to understand that some people might be losing their relationship to the ocean because that has what has made us unique as a people here in Hawaii. Thanks for the question, Ashley. Yes. And that came from, from Kay. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I'm just wondering, um, something that I've heard recently is, as uh, natural resource conservationists and, and, and professionals, it's very hard um, in this changing environment to keep hope alive and to keep a great perspective uh, versus having kind of more of a doomsday attitude. And I'm just wondering if you have any specific recommendations or anything that you uh, do in particular that really uh, helps you keep up uh, your spirit and, and to pass on hope to others. I heard you mention that, you know, you may have a bad day at the office and, and some people run down to the ocean and jump in. Um, but w what are some other things that you have? Yeah, I think as I started to kind of look at more of the climate change effects on people, a lot of it are these assumptions that we won't be changing along with our environment, yet we will be. We'll be adapting at the same time as our environment adapts. And that's something that's really hard for us to understand. It's easy to project sea level rise in 100 years. Or it might not be easier than mothers, but they've been doing it for a while. Um, yet it's really hard to predict how our, us as a society will be changing at the same time. I think this new generation that's coming up underneath us, they have a very different perspective. Some of them see the doomsday, but some of them see the shining lining. They see that 
as long as they continue their connection with the environment, as long as they're able to feel the world moving beneath them, they're the future. Um, I think that's something that we each can't forget. And we tend to forget it. The more we look at data, the more we look at numbers, the more we're stuck looking at these processes in a very flat, um, like single dimensional way. But if you get out into the environment, you understand how things change. You feel that. And by feeling it, um, you give yourself hope. I don't think I've gotten very discouraged by the fact of climate change. I think I try to do everything I can to decrease my um, impact on the environment, yet I feel like this Earth will continue without us. Um, it will always survive. And it's just how we adapt to it that will change. And the only way to adapt to it is with a positive attitude and by continuing our relationship with these places. Because as Anita Marstad said, if we don't feel these places, if we don't understand them, then they become valueless. We have no connection to them. And that, I think, is, what's the, mo is the scariest part of it. I think staying, um, staying hopeful is pretty easy, as long as you're out there and you see the beauty every once in a while, whether it be snow or rain, sunshine. Excellent. Thank you. And then we have a question coming in over the phone from Jim. Hey, no, this is Jim. Uh, I had a question about um, your when you went out and did your interviews. Did you get a sense from people um, how they would value the impact or rate the impact of climate change versus other stressors on the environment, particularly things like overdevelopment and um, crowding the beaches and that kind of thing? Definitely. I think that um, idea of scale, I didn't talk about it too much today, but the scale of impacts and the scale um, that the surfers understand things definitely vary such as, you know, these kind of decrease in stream flow and rainfall events compared to the large hurricane or semi-hurricanes that we come through have a total different impact. And so that ability of every storm coming through to give them big surf kind of negates the fact that the other times it might be pretty small. Same thing with the um, water quality itself. I think they understand those longer term um, impacts of erosion. They understand how tsunamis affect them. Um, and all those things seem to have a much larger impact on a site. The ending of sugarcane in Hawaii had a huge impact on surfers, and that's something we would never have been able to predict. But most of the surfers talk more about the impact of those types of things, erosion, the um, urban development upstream that also leads to different types of pollutants in the water. They talk about those things much more than the fact that we have less wind flow today. Yeah. Thanks. Excellent, thank you. And I saw that uh, KQ was typing as well. And then, uh, yeah, I can see her question. Yes. Um, KQ's question is, how do you assess the connection to the place? Um, there's a couple different variables that we've been using. I've been trying to um, integrate things from the recreational literature. Um, there's a lot of connection to place literature out there that exists as well. And it's interesting to note how a lot of these scales have changed through time. Um, most of my, the surfers that I interviewed, they were given questions on a 10-point scale. So see, in my case, I was trying to see if they were able, if the people more connected to the place saw things differently, um, observed the variables of the place different than people who might not have been as connected to the place. and for this site alone, at least at Honolulu, I wasn't able to find anybody not connected to the place. And that was based on um, very standardized questions from the literature. So they asked different people. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the questions that they asked uh, or that we asked in the survey. Um, we asked them, you know, if you aren't able to come and surf at a particular site, how much would that impact you? We asked if they are to choose from different sites, um, how is that different? Um, and very similar, like I said, the questions that I asked are standardized questions, and the people who are asked the same questions in Maryland um, have the very similar responses. Surfers are really connected to place. Um, and those are different than the interviews I did with the other watermen, the fishermen, and the sailor. In those people, I didn't exactly assess their connection to the place. Um, their, uh, their connection to that place was sort of 
assessed externally by their peers because they were all identified through a snowball process to understand who are the experts that really know this place. And by being recommended, it's saying that everyone around you in your community understands that you are of this place and you know how it works. And it's very interesting how some of those people, you know, are, of course, in their 60s and 70s. And other of those people are still in their late 20s, very young individuals. Yet the community around them recognize them not only for their knowledge, but their ability to understand the processes that are important in that place. Um, and so that was done by a peer-reviewed process. Yeah. So there's a couple of different methods that can be used. Thank you. And I'm just wondering if anybody over at um, the Ruston office had any questions that they wanted to ask. No, I think we're good here. Thank you, Ashley. Excellent. And then, Laura, while I have you, did you have any any um, last last minute comments that you'd like to pass along? Uh, I would just like to thank uh, Noah Lonnie for giving this presentation. Uh, I enjoyed it very much, and thank you to the attendees. And please join us next time for our webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. And then, Noelani, any closing thoughts for you as well? No. I think I just encourage people to really start thinking outside of the box as we go into interdisciplinary work and really understanding how our climates are changing, is to really understand that the climate will continue to change, and it, as we as a people need to change with it and understand our relationship to this place. Thank you.